Hi, Rohan Patel, Comic Book Movie. Hi, Peter. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Doing well, man. Thank you. Uh, I loved your. I mean, I'm a huge fan of yours, so it was great. Thank you. It's great to talk to you. Um, so I wanted to get started with. Um, you've done so many variety of films throughout your career. Including you did the Great Beer Run recently. You've done this Ricky Stanicki, and obviously you did the Green Book a few years ago. What kind of stories sort of speak to you at this stage of being a director and a writer? Um, it's not. You know, it's a funny thing. It's not one thing. It's just. I know it when I hear it, and I, I'm, I'm not like going out looking for specific things, and people tell me stories all the time, or I hear about this, or script ideas, and and when I hear it, I know it. Like Beer Run, I remember thinking, what an amazing thing that this guy took beer to his friend in, in his friends in Vietnam during the war, and I just knew I, I wanted to do it. Um, and Stanicki, same thing. Right now, I'm actually looking at... A, a project about Billy Walters, who is considered the world's greatest sports better. And it's a real guy, and I, I'm i just fascinated in it. So it, it, it's really, I don't really know until I hear it. Awesome. And so in this movie, you get to work with John Cena, and you really put him through a lot. And he, like, I mean, he's, he's just game for anything you give him. Yeah. And so what is it kind of like working with John and giving him, are you pitching ideas on Cena, or is it all scripted, or... How's that sort of working relationship? It's like, hey, John, would you do this? Or It's mostly scripted. I'm not surprising them at the end. Uh, but uh, no, it is 95% scripted. And then we'd say, okay, let's try this, let's try that. But, uh, you know, John, John was the most prepared actor I've ever worked with. He knew that script backwards and forwards before we ever started shooting it and just nailed it. And, uh, he, and I think people are going to be shocked at how funny he is. Oh yeah, no, I, I loved it. Um, and so then you also, you always, I've noticed a lot of your films, you always have, there's a very sincere element, even the ending of this film is very, there's a very sincere, um, like genuine, believable ending. I'm not obviously going to give away, but like, is, is that something you like about your stories or is that something that within you that you feel like, and it's not easy to capture sincerity on screen either. So what's your sort of approach to that? Well, I always just think if the characters are real, and you feel that there are real people, and they've got you know, they and their hearts are in the right place. Then you're gonna like them more, and then we could, and also we could have more fun with them, more jokes, more more laughs if you like them. And um, and there is a message to this movie. It's not just a bunch of laughs. It's a message about many messages. One is you know that anybody can change at any time. If just decide, I'm going to be a better person, and be that, and you can actually do it. And more than that, it's like, what ha the other thing is, what happens when your lies come alive? And these guys have been telling these lies forever, and all of a sudden, it's that, th those lies are in this person, and they got to live with their own lies. And how do you do that? There's a lot of little interesting things in here. Yeah, absolutely. And then you also get to, re you get to reunite with Zac Efron on this, and yeah. also working with uh, Jermaine Fowler and Andrew Santino. So yeah. what was it like? Because Zach Efron's obviously done so much work, but Jermaine and Andrew are also comedians turned actors. So yeah. what's that kind of dynamic like? Uh, well, they're both great actors. I I, I knew that, um, but uh, yeah, it is. It, it's a. It's it's nice to have those two guys. Like I compare them to like they would be Jack Lemmon. Both those guys. Uh, that those are the Jack Lemmon characters to uh, Zach's Tony Curtis. You know, Tony, Zach's the leading man guy. He's the guy, like, it, it seems like the straight man is not at all. It's the guy who holds it all together is Zach. And if you don't have Zach, there's nothing. But he's the guy who's in the center and trying to make sense of this all. But he's also the guy who started the whole thing, the lie, and is there's a reason that he has. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And... Um... So when you're first, like, I, I saw there was a couple writers on this film, including mm. you, and it's like, what, when you got the film, what were you sort of adding to it? What did you want to add to it? Or what, like, because it is a lie come to life. So what was it, what vantage point did you think that you brought to this story that well, made it? Well, I got this script 15 years ago, and it was written by a guy named Jeff Bouchel, and it was the idea, there was a guy, they create a character that they blame everything on, but it wasn't, it, it didn't go the way it goes now. And then... We rewrote it with, you know, uh, other guys, Brian Jarvis, Jim Freeman, Pete Jones, and Mike Cerrone. We, there's a big group of us. We all went in and we wrote it and then rewrote it and then rewrote it. It took forever because it's a complicated, it, it, it took me longer than any script I've ever worked on because it's a, it, it's, it, the, the truth is 
it, the jokes are great. I love the jokes, but the thing that makes for me work, it makes it work, is that there's a reason behind uh, uh, the lies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I was also kind of curious. I did read this about you that you were an accounting major back in college. Yeah. So well, I, I'm I'm currently an accountant, so that's kind of my day job. So I just got done doing that. But um, I was kind of curious, like, what kind of motivated you at that stage of your life when you're finishing and then kind of trying to transition to writing and then obviously to directing? Um, when I got out of high school, my brain was like a big blob of nothing. And when I started college, uh, I had the, uh, I met with my advisor the first week and he said, what's your major? I said, I, I don't know. He said, well, you have good math boards. How about accounting? I said, okay. And that was literally all the thought that went into it, that, that two seconds. Okay? And I did that for four years because <clears throat> there was no, there, I had no, there was nothing. It wasn't until I was in my mid twenties where it occurred to me, sheesh, you know, what am I doing? You know, my brain, I, you know, they say age 25 is the age of reason. And it was right about then where I started thinking, what, what, how did I get into this? Like why, you know, and I, and I, for the first time in my life pursued something, which was writing and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I didn't. I, I I like to think that my brain hadn't grown yet until I was in my mid twenties. Yeah, yeah, no, I I I can relate to that. <laughs> um, and then um, so you also have this series, Louder Milk, which is also like is blowing up on streaming right now. Mm. And I'm sure you've experienced that before with your films, like Dumb and Dumber, or something. I remember growing up, we watch all the time. Or there's something about Mary. These are were on TBS, but now everything's Amazon, Netflix, and all that stuff. So how, what, what are you kind of seeing from your point of view? It's like these series are coming alive later versus when they're actually on air. Well, it's kind of a gift. It was, a, believe it or not, it was a gift. We made that show on a thing called the Audience Network, which no longer exists. And they didn't have a lot of money, but they told us, come here, make your show. You can do whatever you want. We're not going to interfere. They gave us notes, by the way, but there were good notes and very few. So we just went off in three years and we did a show that nobody was stopping us from doing and luckily now it's back on netflix and when it came on netflix instead of having like a 10 episode one season people kind of there's 30 episodes so you could really really get into it but more than that we were able to there's a kind of humor in there that people aren't are afraid to do and we weren't we did it and i think it's that's why the thing's succeeding i think because it's it's kind of it's there was nothing holding us back and uh, and i'm really proud of that show i want to do a couple more seasons of it at least yeah yeah and um i was also kind of i love one of another one of your films that you made a while back fever pitch mm. which is obviously about the red sox i'm a huge red sox fan too so like have you ever considered because you can obviously make that for a couple of different sports franchises now is that another even the patriots but um is that another film that you would maybe like to revisit as a sequel i know you did dumb and dumber two a couple of years ago but um as, or are there any other films from your past filmography that you would want to revisit? Uh, you know, it's funny you should ask that because the, we have been talking about Fever Pitch doing a TV show about mm -hmm. Fever Pitch. And the idea is the people who work in the front office of the Red Sox and, uh, and uh, that world. Uh, but it didn't seem like, no, it, it, when we made it, it didn't seem like a sequel type movie because it had the greatest ending ever. We got lucky and they won the whole thing, you know? Because originally when we did it, by the way, that script was written by Lowell Gantz and Babalu Mandel. And when we were doing it, they were supposed to lose, like they always do. And they didn't. And we were winging it. It was, a, it was kind of an amazing moment uh, to be there. But so, yeah, uh, other sequels, I, I would do a third Dumb and Dumber. I really liked to hang with those guys. Oh, yeah, that'd be incredible. But uh, thank you so much for your time, Peter. I really appreciate it. This thank you. So awesome. I appreciate thank it. You. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. See you. Yeah, bye.